Inside the Cube in Palo Alto, the home of Cloudera, where we sit in SiliconAngle.com. I'm John Furrier, the founder of SiliconAngle. I'm here with Chris Gladwin, uh, Gladwin the president and CEO of Cleversafe. Chris, welcome back. <laughs> Almost, <laughs> it's an easy name to remember, but uh, it's you know, a compound word. Yeah. That people have a surprising <laughs> amount of trouble with it. Uh, we're here at the Cube. We want to talk about you know just your business and some of the climate opportunity out there sure. for, for folks and, and your customers and challenges. So, so first, start off with uh, you know what's going on with you guys and Clever Safe and what's the update on the company. Well, John, thanks for having me here. I appreciate it. It's, uh, it's a pleasure to talk about these topics. So the some of the latest developments with, with Cleversafe, um, at a high level what we're seeing is there's so much interest in cloud computing that it's really pulling through a lot of interest and awareness in cloud storage because obviously if you're going to compute, you need to store. And that's just b been really fortunate for us, you know, whereas two, three, four years ago it was just difficult to get awareness uh, with these kind of issues in a broad sense. Now it's, you know, kitchen table conversation in a lot of places, particularly within the storage industry, it's, it's, it's a topic. So that's helped us quite a bit. You know, we've uh, recently had some pretty key customer announcements, one with the U.S. intelligence community, uh, and then we also uh, just completed a, a big round of funding. And we're, you know, internally we're getting a lot of traction and momentum and excitement. What was the round of that, the size of that round? $31.4 million is what we... Nice. Uh, Congratulations. Thank you. Yeah, Thank fresh you. money. <laughs> yeah, that's important. For technology expansion, sales, marketing, any particular focus, all of the above? It's all the above. I mean, this, the stage of the company now is we, we're about five and a half years old. And we began delivering product kind of on a limited basis a year or two ago. And really the middle of last year is when we began deploying production larger scale systems. So from a money point of view, it's, you know, we're still kind of expanding the capabilities, but now we're also in sales and marketing and all the other things that you operate a business for. We're here with Chris Gladwin from the CEO of Clever Safe. You guys are based in Chicago. We are in based the Midwest. in Chicago. Um, you don't have to be in Silicon Valley to be successful. You guys are doing very well lately uh, uh, around uh, storage, a different kind of storage, and uh, the emphasis is on security. Yep. So could you talk a little bit about um, that aspect of your business in particular? Well, what we saw early on, and there were a lot of surveys that, that we had access to about what's important to customers. And in a cloud environment, you're essentially giving physically someone else your information. So obviously security is a, is a big concern. And that uh, fortunately for us is something that we do well. So in addition to the capability of cloud, which is flexibility, limitless scale, things like that, you also have to do that in a way that's secure. And there's really three dimensions to that. You know, the classic textbook def definition of information security includes confidentiality, uh, means that the bad guys can't see it. It means integrity, which means that the data is perfect to, to the people that should see it. It's no good if they can see bits and the bits aren't right. And then finally, availability, meaning it's always available to people that should see it. It's kind of an easy acronym to remember because it's CIA. <laughs> and uh, and you have some clients that are government related, right? Yeah, we recently... the security aspect. Right, we recently announced a strategic partnership with InQtel, and InQtel is the kind of the business development arm of the U.S. intelligence community. They work a lot with agencies CIA. like the CIA. <laughs> so we have to differentiate it on the slide. Yeah. Um, but, but really, when we talk about information security, you know, we mean confidentiality, integrity, and availability. And that's essential. I mean, y you, you know, it goes without saying, but if you have a, a system, you know, yeah. data is the lifeblood of the business. It's the yeah. assets of, a, of an individual. You know, those things have to just be there at a very high level. I mean, it, it can't be compromised. It's got to be right, and it's always got to be there, period. Yeah, I mean, you know, you guys have been around for five years. There's a lot, obviously, a lot of you know, conscious with, like, the government, the CIA, with the funding from yep. InQtel. Um, but as an entrepreneur, you know, life has some surprises. The world kind of spins your way once in a sure, while. Yeah. For you guys, it seems to be the case where the world has spun your way with yep. the focus on, obviously, the adoption of cloud yep. and, yep. you know, privacy and security. Yeah. So, you know, that being said, what are you seeing out in the marketplace for the key trends? I mean, obviously security is one we'll, we'll dive into, but outside of security, what are you seeing out there as macro trends in the marketplace? Well, the, the, you know, one of the macro, the macro trends is obviously the cloud thing, and there are reasons why that are driving it. You know, you, you see this again and again, and you know, this is part of the cloud you know, folklore practically about you know, electrical power generation people used to make their own, then it became centralized and more efficient. You know, it used to be that most companies had their own physical data centers. Now everyone uses common hosting facilities. When I when I was starting my career, I was a network person you know, and, and did some storage work too. As a at a large aerospace company, where I was responsible for their networking and their storage products. And back then, you know, when TCP/IP first came out, 
you know, we had TCP IP, but it was our network. I mean, it wasn't an internet. It was, yeah. you know, we had our own lease lines. And so it kind of started out as a private thing, but eventually it became much more efficient to uh, have that aggregated as, as a public service, which is just kind of aggregating a bunch of private needs into one thing. So the, the same thing's happening with kind of some of the basics of computing. Computing itself, storage, things like that are going through that transition now. And is that really kind of the, the whole focus of private cloud, where IT has had their own kind of private environment, enterprises, yeah. yeah. lease lines, as yeah. you mentioned in the old days, um, to now dealing with public infrastructure, aka yeah. public cloud. Yep. Just like we saw, you know, you saw in the 80s with networking, whereas those technologies came out, they first were used for public, or sorry, for private networks within enterprises, and then became public. We see the same thing happening. Even though there's a lot of visibility to public cloud storage, most of the business today is private cloud. So that's mainly what we've been selling, is private clouds that we sell to government agency, you know, a large bank, a big social networking site. Um, that's you know, mainly what we're seeing. And now, they're definitely longer term, public is gonna be uh, probably the larger segment of the market, but today, uh, most of the action is private clouds. From your chair um, you know, here or in uh, your office, uh, looking at the industry, where are we with the whole public-private cloud? I see there's a, there's a collision course yep. between, obviously, the benefits of public. Um, what inning are we in, so to speak? I mean, where are we? Is it yeah, integration-based, second, base, inning. second yeah. inning? I yeah. mean, what are the key challenges for this kind of collision? Um, I see yeah. everyone's talking about test ops and test and dev ops are kind of going to the cloud and yeah. uh, mission critical, but emphasis of production where the costs are heavier and scale issues are there. Yep. You, know, you get companies that have scale operations and they have to kind of move there. Yep. What, what are you seeing in the market for that transition? Well, I, I don't ultimately see it as a collision. Uh, you know, like a lot of things, I it'll become both. You know, y you'll take the requirements of public and private clouds, and when those can both be met, then it'll kind of merge to one. I mean, if you look at networking today, and you know, people still have VPN all the time over the internet to make essentially a virtual private network on top of the public infrastructure, you're definitely going to see the same kind of thing happen with cloud storage. And we already um, have uh, the capabilities to deliver public, use of public infrastructure, but with the privacy, auditability, manageability, control that defines um, a private cloud. So, you know, a private internal requirement. So it's already possible today to kind of merge those two things. Obviously, you know, very similar. Uh, paradigm of the 80s with networking, yep. seeing that now. Very similar. Um, so you have this converged networking landscape, right? You yep. know, the storage guys, the networking guys, yep. uh, and the compute guys, the servers, um, kind of collisioning together. There's not a lot of talk going on around the compute side. It seems to be an abundance of compute. Storage seems to be the key linchpin in all the conversations, whether it's a Hadoop, which we're in Cloudera's office here, to kind of, you know, industrial strength storage. And I wrote a post this morning called the, you know, the Storage Cloud. Yep. How is storage changing uh, in that in that equation, in the converged networking equation? Yep. I'll say it's more relevant. I mean, data's not going away. It's only getting bigger and bigger. Absolutely. But latency is an issue, speed, application yep. support, multiple applications. Uh, how would you kind of summarize that whole dynamic? I mean, is it you know, uh, a tsunami of change? Is it going to be um, something that's going to be slowly rolled in? Is yep. it well, I think cloud I is a part of the first real, m like, change in the dominant ar architecture paradigm for computing since, you know, the 80s, you know, when the personal computer paradigm really became the dominant paradigm. Um, and, you know, that from a storage point of view, where y you basically had a hard drive, and that primarily defined your data as, as a local device that was associated with you as a person, and it was typically in your PC. You know, the internet delivered new kinds of applications, but you still had your data uh, as your own. Um, clearly, we're going through a big transition where we're moving to a new paradigm. And, and that's a big, you know, cloud is a part of that, where you say, now I want my data to exist independent of a particular device that I might have. Because in fact, I may have 10 devices. I may have a computer in my, you know, office, one at home, one in my car, different sizes for different functions. So, th so that answer has to become, independent of all those devices, I have my storage, and that's my information. And that transcends those devices as they come and go during my life, which those devices always will, the data persists. So that, that's a big driver to cloud storage uh, that we see. And, and that's a big shift. So a part of that is the cloud, which is kind of the back-end bulk store. And then clearly what you're going to see, local storage effectively just becomes a cache. 
off that. And you know, for certain devices, they'll cache a lot more stuff. You know, other devices they'll cache less because they're smaller, more mobile. But you know, the net application-specific kind of scenarios, right? Yeah, but the net result is it'll just feel like your data is always there no matter what. And, and clearly, that's something people want. They don't want this idea of well, if I use this device, I can see this, and if I use that device, I can see that, and I've got to try to sit there and figure out what goes where. That's way too complicated. So, that's that's you know that's a lot of what's going to drive that paradigm and that's a big part of cloud and then you look at you know the technologies of cloud you know flash mobile devices multi-device kind of lifestyles i mean that's all converging to this new architecture we're here with chris gladwell the uh, president of clever safe uh, uh, from mit he's a geek uh, uh, developer he's got uh, hundreds of patents uh, here on the uh, on this on the solution um, mm. question for you uh, your, from your definition, big data. Yep. Yeah, that's the big buzzword these yep. days. Obviously, data, yep, sure. data, and big data, fast data, small data, data in general. We get the Strata conference next week, which we'll be broadcasting live. Uh, so it's an angle the queue. Yep. What's your definition of big data? Uh, big, you know the the. Well, let me first say that all the growth of data is big data. It was uh, prior to 1999. Um, most data. And when I say most data, I mean cut open a random internet cable or break open a random hard drive and count the bits. Prior to 1999, most data was structured data, like data in a database, and the data type itself was numbers or text. 1999 was when it switched over, and that was driven by uh, digital music distributed over the internet. And which you have some history with. Which I have <laughs> some history with. <laughs> we'll we'll get into that in a second. And that's when it, so image and audio data then cross 50%, so these large unstructured objects. Since then, with the emergence of digital video, it's now in the 65-70% range of all data is this big data, primarily digital content. And then going forward, you know, the longer you go out in time, the more it approaches 100% of all data. So you're still going to have structured data in a database, but it's just going to be a sideshow from a bit point of view compared to big data. So that, that's how we would characterize just large unstructured data objects, and, and it's 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 already dominating storage. I mean, the internet. It's pretty much already turned into a video distribution machine, and it's going to become just more so a big video distribution machine. Digital data is obviously big right now. We see iTunes, and you have a little history in the yeah, sure. industry. Talk about your background, and for the folks out there who don't know from the history with, you have with music, which is the yeah. most popular <laughs> digital asset out there. It days. is, but video. I mean, video is really yeah. happening. Um, so, like you said, I went to MIT, was an engineer, and then I worked. Um, for a large aerospace company as a buyer of technology, networking products, storage products. I did that for a while, and then I switched to the vendor side where I made computer products, and I you know, did different jobs, you know, engineering, product strategy, yeah. you know, yeah. marketing. And then from there, I start, started starting companies. And the first company I started um, was Cruise Technologies, which at the time I thought, you know, the way to have a great company is to do something that's just so hard no one else can do it. But the reality is you, you can be ahead of your market, and that was way ahead of its market. You know, that was, um, you know, the 90s, um, mid-90s, and we were making wireless thin clients, you know, like an <laughs> iPad. <laughs> and needless to say, we were a little ahead of the market. A little bit. Yeah. A couple of years. Yeah. So, you know, we ended up selling that IP, and then um, I started a digital music company called Music Now, which was the leading business-to-business -business supplier of digital music services. So... Best Buy, Clear Channel, Charter, Earthlink. They had digital music services, download stores, internet radio, uh, music subscription services. But it was just their brand, and it was all us. You know, we aggregated all the rights, uh, operated all the servers, figured out, you know, this penny goes to this guy, and that penny goes to that guy. Yeah, micropayments, dealing with DRM kind of all the stuff. Licenses and all, and all that stuff. Yeah. <laughs> so, we, you know, that's, that's obvious, you know. Complex. It was not, not simple. Yeah, it was... There, you know, there was a lot of interest and complexity. That certainly one aspect was technology. Back then, that was big storage to store all music. Not so much anymore, but back then it was kind of a big storage system. Plus, that rights, you know, distribution was extraordinarily complicated. More so, legally, and just the reality of getting all those licenses that was remarkably complicated. Yeah, building a system to administer and pay them and audit and all that stuff, that was fairly complicated, too. Let's talk about Clever Safe and your current, your current sure. project. Uh, obviously, you got a lot of funding, you know, $34 million. No one's just writing checks, uh, you know, yep. the guys in the street holding their hand out. It's a yep. you know, significant amount of capital. Yep. You guys have a five-year track record. Um, where did you get the idea, you know, that RAID is dead? I mean, not the, not the canned answer, you know, data's growing, but I mean, you must have had some yeah. kernel of, you know, we're going to do things a little bit differently. The world's maybe different in vision. Talk about where the inspiration was and the idea behind uh, 
clever safes, that technology. Well, in my prior company, Music Now, we built the system to store all music. And, you know, we, we kind of experienced the state of the art of the customer. And honestly, I thought it was pretty bad. You know, I mean, um, there were times when, you know, whole arrays would fail and they would never come back. I mean, it, and it just was beyond me. Like, how can this be? Um, how can this be state of the art? There's got to be a better way. A lot of my background, in addition to storage products, is in wireless products. And, you know, when you talk to a storage guy, you know, they talk about a bit error rate of every 10 to the 14, every 10, 10 to 15 bits on a drive. In the meantime, to failure, you know, a, you know, a thousand, couple thousand hours, something like that. They have no idea what failure and bit error rates are when compared to wireless. Like, when you're driving 60 miles an hour with a mobile phone yeah. and you're talking away, the amount of retransmission drama yeah, that's going yeah, yeah, on. Yeah, exactly. Packets are getting lost. You're driving by a building with a steel wall. The yeah, connection drops. Yeah. On and on and on. And and there are techniques. Or like you know when um, you know when a spacecraft goes to Mars and it's talking back and forth. I mean, th these these techniques. You know these advanced coding techniques, erasure coding, Reed Solomon, port error correction, whatever you want to call them. They've been around for 30 years to wireless guys. And so as a wireless guy, you look at storage and you say. They're not doing this? Like it's like a radio. Talk to each other, right? Yeah. I mean, you, you, you look at, you know, state-of-the-art in storage with RAID is parity. And, you know, maybe you have one or two-dimensional parity bits. And it's like, okay, that's great. That was like the 60s in wireless. And, <laughs> you know, there's, a, there's other ways to do this. Now, the, the reason why this hasn't happened before has to do with Moore's Law. Back in, let's say, 1990, 1991, um, a CPU was a lot slower than it is now. You know, microprocessors, you know, were maybe a million times slower. So to do some extra math would slow things down. But things have changed. In 1991, um, you know, the average hard drive, for example, took uh, about 60 seconds to read or write all the data on the drive. Um, drives have gotten a lot bigger, but they haven't gotten much faster. So now it takes somewhere around 16 hours to read or write the data on a 2 terabyte drive. So now this trade-off, and meanwhile, CPU's got a million times faster. So now and you abundance, can tons of abundance of compute power. Yeah. So now you can employ some advanced. You know, math is your friend. You know, when Moore's and Moore's law basically is the cost of math, and the cost of math is a million times cheaper. So you can do some pretty interesting stuff without really noticing performance degradation, or without really noticing cost. And so that that kind of transition, that crossover from you know driven by Moore's law, enables these kind of advanced coding techniques for storage, which to a wireless person is like hard to believe the industry isn't already doing this. And so you had the idea, so you start sketching out some ideas right. and you form a company around it. Is that yeah. kind of how it went? And then boom, you got a product, some patents, and is that uh, yeah, is that you the know, path? Um, <laughs> well, I having started a couple companies, I one thing I wanted to do, which we did uh, here, was I wanted the first thing or as soon as possible to sell it even if it's not built like go try and sell it and see what the reaction is so the the very first thing i did is i i, I kind of wrote just a little very basic long since replaced prototype just to prove okay this is going to work all right once that was done the first thing i did is i worked with uh, one of the other founders who also went to mit is an interaction designer and so she created what looked like a completely functioning system Yet. Wizard of Oz kind of thing, behind the curtain. You yeah, know, so yeah. essentially what she did is she <laughs> went to the Yahoo That's Small smart. Business site and screen scraped every screen and then pasted on there, like as a graphic artist, not as a developer, what looked like other menu options, okay? And so we had both done a lot of focus groups, and so we knew how to pretend to be, you know, focus group moderators. So we ran a bunch of focus groups where we would, you know, like normal pay people 50 bucks, and they'd yeah. sit there and ask these questions. And we ran focus groups on what looked like a completely done system. And, you know, the, the things that we found were, you know, I've, I've done a lot of focus groups. And you look for certain things. You look of, for unaided and aided awareness of the problems, people willingness to pay, yeah. satisfaction with alternatives. And data and, and information, it's just off the charts. I mean, the value of storage, which really is your, your information as a business, as a person, is immensely valuable. And it it's growing in its value. I mean, how dependent we are on digital information. So that's, I mean, if you want to sell something to someone, they better value it. Okay, so that's highly valued. Th there was a, a great deal of aided or unaided awareness of problems, like, oh, when my hard drive dies, my data's gone. 
Um, and there was a, di- a very high level of dissatisfaction with the currently available alternatives. So, you know, that's the combination so you, you look sold, for. So you sold it, and it's like, let's go build it, and you did, right? Yeah, we, we ran focus groups. Yeah. And, you know, you score, you know, these different, and we did, you know, enterprise, small business, consumer, and and you look at these results, you're like, man, this is this is it. So then we said, all right, now we got to go build it. And building a dispersed storage system, it's been... These advanced math te- techniques have been known since the 50s, and they've been used in other uh, industries like wireless. And there has been some use of them in storage, not so much in the commercial world, but in I- incredibly secure environments like the storage of cryptographic keys or weapon launch codes and things like that. They've used these kinds of techniques before. Um, and there's been a lot of academic work in these areas over 20 years. So it's been known to some degree. But to commercialize it, I mean, just to give you a sense, so we had algorithms working in uh, the, like 2005, the algorithms were working, and that's interesting. But, you know, a customer doesn't buy algorithms, a customer buys a system that can be installed and upgraded and tuned and managed and configured. And deliver and the value. And okay. secure and reliable and fast. And so building that whole ecosystem around, you know, that. Well, that's, you know, taken us another five years. And, you know, we knew it was a long project. Other companies tried, and they, they really couldn't get it to, to go. Some deep tech news. Let's talk, let's talk about the company, um, your company, CleverSafe. So uh, you got some funding. How many employees do you have? I think right now we have right around 48. So you guys are growing. Yep. So where do you guys stack up in the, in the marketplace, so your business compared to others, in terms of um, who you're competing with, and then just overall approach to the business? Yep. Um, obviously, there's different approaches these days. You talk to anyone in storage, and, you know, there's a big opportunity with a lot of the other players been taken out with acquisitions. Yep. You know, everyone knows about three parts and sure. and others. And so there's a huge, big vacuum. Yeah, there's not a lot of mid-sized things. storage companies left. Um, and there's not even a lot of like bigger, small storage companies left. I mean, What's the core strategy for you guys right now? You got the funding. You're going you're gonna to go out and you're going to uh, sell on the differentiated features yeah. of it? Talk about, talk about that. Well, there's kind of two phases to how we're building this business. The phase that we're in now is a phase where just having a product that that's operational and ships and finishes QA and all that stuff is part of the answer. What a customer buys is a result. You know, they have a business result, like they want the system to operate and deliver certain benefits. So, um, little phone ring there. <laughs> so, um, so what happens is, you know. The thing you want to look for is a customer that buys an initial system and then comes back and buys a second order that's maybe 10 times bigger. Now, that's the best validation you have. That means it really works and they want more. So we're really focused on that and then having that customer be thrilled, you know, that they're referenceable, you know, that they, they score you high in terms of customer satisfaction. And we really want to focus on getting that done, not necessarily with a thousand customers, but you know, currently with the largest, most discriminating kind of customers, you know, Lighthouse accounts in, in our key markets. And that's really what we're focused on for this year. So you're not seeing a lot of like broad marketing where we want to have a thousand. We've got a lot yeah, of very lot focused of execution. Yes. Next year is when we will say, all right, let's scale it up because we've we've done this enough that we can kind of bottle it and repeat. Hire the sales forces and yeah, go crazy. Yeah, but we we can't underestimate that step. And even though we know it works, if we stumble, can't so for example. It. Let's say we have the world's best algorithms and the install program doesn't work. And the customer has a problem. And it could be some trivial thing in an install program. It won't matter that it was a trivial thing in the install program. The, the reputation will be, oh, that stuff doesn't work. So you, you just have to get everything exactly right, and that's what we're How are you guys on. competing against the EMCs in the world out there, the big players? I mean, IBM, HP, EMC are the big whales out there. And yep. you know, Dell's got now and some solutions in place. I mean, what's the, what's the, uh, the story there? Well, the, the closest competitor to us is EMC has a product called Atmos, and they're using similar techniques. They got a little bit later start than us, so they're, they're not as far along in terms of the maturity of the product. But, but it's, you know, they're a smart company, and they're on their way, and they'll certainly uh, work through these issues. And that's good for us. I mean, actually, we, we want them to succeed because it validates. Got a comparable the in the market. You got to compare yeah. the benchmark yeah. against. Yeah. yeah, I mean, our issue is not, I mean, we go head to head with them every once in a while, but mainly what we compete against in terms of an actual live customer situation is a customer that's thinking about building it themselves. That's the number one thing we compete with uh, in terms of a customer. Sometimes they're looking at like mm-hmm. taking some Hadoop and some other stuff and wiring it together. That's normally what we compete against. And um, 
you know, that, that still shows that our issue is kind of getting the market going, not so much, you know, A versus C versus the C, you know, D competition. When, when we get to that point, we've succeeded in kind of moving the needle, but uh, we're still in the early stages. We have Chris, Chris Gladwin, CEO of Clever Save. Chris, uh, thanks for coming on the Cube. Um, question about the tech and, and the product, the product angle. What's the key differentiation for you guys in the product? I mean, you, you mentioned security, and we'll drill a little bit down into that, but what yep. are the key differentiates for you right now? Well, that's the one we wrap it around is secure cloud storage. So that's what we sell is secure clouds, um, secure storage clouds. And as I said before, you know, confidentiality, integrity, and availability. Th those are the things that we lead with. Now, there's other advantages. Um, cost efficiency, which is kind of the same thing as power efficiency, space efficiency. You just need less servers, less electricity, less capital. And for some customers, it's cost. For some others, it's power. And for others, it's space. Um, and so th those are those are some of the key things that we really focus on. And, and there's some other benefits we could talk about, like scalability. You know, the, the system can scale to forever if you're using a uh, object interface, for example, which is unique. I mean, you can literally have a namespace with 10 exabytes in it, and you know, a lot, a lot of simultaneous writers in that same container. No one else can do that. But r you, you got to kind of pick your thing to focus on, and we really focus on secure cloud storage. What do you think about the efficiency message? I mean, obviously, every vendor has a storage efficiency because, you know, storage is getting bigger and bigger. Yeah. I mean, everyone has to have an efficiency story. What's the, uh, what's your take on the, the storage efficiency messaging in general from other folks in the marketplace? Yep. And then what's your strategy and message around efficiency? Well, that's, that's where dispersal has real advantages. The, the traditional approach people have used to create reliability is to create copies as well as to use parity bits, which is RAID. So in an enterprise environment, it's not at all unusual for someone to have three copies. It, and it's not at all unusual for them to have many more than three. But if you just say, you know, a person's got three copies, maybe, you know, two in one location or one remote or something like that, and they're using parity, you know, which means it's an array array, which it pretty much already is, always is. If you add up all the bits that you end up with, uh, and there might be some other inefficiencies introduced by, you know, a file system or kind of how they lay things out. But at a minimum, you're, for every bit of original information, you end up with five bits to store. And now you've got five bits to air condition, and five bits to you know, buy equipment for, and yeah. five bits worth of floor space, and so on and so on. And there's just no way around it. That's, that's what drives your cost. Dispersal enables you to get you know, way higher reliability. So a typical, talk about dispersal. We didn't, we didn't get into that, yeah. but you, that's your core different approach. Yep. You guys have a dispersal. Yep. Uh, approach, yep. which is spreading stuff around, kind of like uh, yep. uh, dispersing the data and then having multiple copies. Just take us through that real quick. Yeah, so as I said, it, normally to create reliability, you would maybe have three copies. And so the value of that would be I could so tolerate two simultaneous failures because I got three copies. And if I put those in three locations, then I can handle two location failures. If I put those in one location, I can handle two server failures. So, you know, you can figure that based on your business requirements. But that's a very expensive way to get reliability, and it has security problems because what you want to do from an availability point of view is make multiple copies and put them in multiple places. That's exactly what you don't want to do from a security point of view because you're basically putting your attack surfaces all over the place. Uh, and there's other things that doesn't address, like data integrity. There's other ways to create reliability besides making copies, <coughs> and that's what dispersal does. So a typical example would be, let's say I have a, a file or an object to store, or a block of data. Instead of just writing those copies, meaning I'm writing ones and zeros that are the data. It might be encrypted, it might be compressed, it doesn't matter. I'm just writing, it's real data. And then I might put a parity bit at the end if it's on a rate array. There's a different way, to, there's other ways to represent information. And it you involves know, a little bit more math, but math is cheap, because in Moore's Law, math is you know, kind of approaching free. So instead of, let's say, so the way a typical dispersive environment would work is I'll take 10 numbers at a time of that data. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to take those 10 numbers, I'm going to do a little linear algebra, and I'm going to make 16 new numbers that have the property that if I have any 10 of them, I can turn it back into the 10 original numbers. And technically how that happens, if you remember in algebra, if you have three equations and three unknowns, you can solve. Um, well, what, what we're really doing with those 10 numbers is we're making 16 equations with 10 variables, and that's what we're storing, is the sums of those equations. So I get any 10 of them, I get 10 unknowns. Now that, and if I put each of those equation sums on 16 different servers, and I could put them in 1, 2, 4, 6, 12, 16 locations, I could create incredible reliability. 
So for example, I can tolerate the simultaneous failure of six things, because I, I have 16, I only need 10. So I get the reliability kind of like seven copies, but in terms of how much I'm physically storing, I'm not storing seven times what I started, started with, I'm storing 1.6 times what I start with. And you know that, that doesn't include the parity, the RAID that I would use in a, in a copy-based system. So you end up, you know, a, a pretty typical environment, you end up with a million times the reliability with, you know, a third or a fourth times the bits. And that's a good trade-off. You mentioned securities, and you mentioned earlier about the storage guys not knowing, you know, yep. the, the, you know the bit errors and things of that nature. But we've seen over the past, you know, 15, 20 years as, you know, client-server has kind of rolled into kind of an internet environment, the convergence between, you know, network guys and developers, app developers, mm -hmm. completely different breeds, you know, network guys, things provisioned. You, in security and storage, we see the same kind of dynamic. Um, you, you, as you just mentioned in your example, you have multiple points of, of stuff being stored. You have more attack points. Yep. So a storage guy is optimized storage on paper, yep. but ultimately is exposed security-wise. Yep. Um, talk about the dynamic you're seeing in the, conver uh, the collision between security and storage from a people standpoint. Because there's security staffs out there, yep. and there's network staffs, there's storage yep. staffs, and we kind of have to live through the old today's world of network and app, yep. kind, of, kind of blending together. Wh what's that status of the security storage guys? Are they kind of coming together, or is it still kind of siloed out? You know, it depends certainly upon the organization. Um, what we found is that we're, we're bringing advanced security capabilities to the market, but at the same time, you, you don't want to present it as something completely new and different. Any organization that cares about security is going to have certain standards, like they have a certain encryption level or encryption type that they're going to use or something like that. It's a very difficult conversation to go in there and explain to them why that's a bad idea and how you should do something better. It's a much easier conversation to say, that's a great idea, we're going to still do that, and we're going to add to it. And, and that's how we approach it. So, you know, even though at some level what we, what we find is the, the person that drives the purchase of a private storage cloud or even a public storage cloud is the security guys. I'm sorry, the storage guys are the ones that are really doing it, mm -hmm. but they have to check in with the security guys. There's compliance and all kinds yeah. of other hurdles right. in the deal. Yeah. So th the way you have to address that is you can deliver a lot of benefits to the, to the storage organization, and they're really ultimately, they typically drive the purchase and operate the system. But you have to do it in such a way that when they take that to their security representatives, they can say, it's, it's, you know, it's what you've already established as a standard and more. And, and that's how we... That's how we've designed the system, and that's how we, you know, communicate those benefits. We're here with Chris Gladwin, the CEO of uh, CleverSafe. Chris, tell us, talk about. Um, let's get into the sharing side and kind of wrap this up. What what advice would you give CIOs if they came to you and said, "Hey, you know, Chris, you know, I'm really looking at cloud yep. seriously. We've done some, you know, toe in the water kind of things, um, but you know, I really got to expand my storage footprint. We got to have a strategy." Um, I need to have, get my arms around this. I need a framework. Mm -hmm. what, should, what should I be thinking about? What should I? What approaches should I be looking at? Well, the things that you want to look for um, are you, you want to have the, the good things about the system that you have now and more. You, you don't want to have a situation where you have to give up. Um, so, for you know, going back to security, for example, um, you don't want to have to suddenly relax your security standards. Um, but there's other. There's other issues. So, for example, auditability, control, tunability, manageability, those kinds of things that, that they're used to in their internal systems, they, they need to demand those same things. Because it, it, you shouldn't have to step back. You should just you should get the, the benefits that they have from their own private resources and get more. You know, flexibility, uh, cost effectiveness, scalability, whatever the, you know, the kind of cloud elements that are important to them, they should be able to get what they add and more. So that's what they should ask for. What kind of things would you say to the CIO if I, was, I asked you about the CIO and I said, Chris, what kind of benefits should I be seeing from all this new tech, yep. the clever safe technology and or other tech around us with converging, yep. you know, consumerization of IT, however you want to call it, but I still need compliance, I still need security. Yep. What things should that be enabling? What environment, or what, what things in my environment mm. uh, sh uh, should be enabling and what are those benefits should I be seeing? Well, it, in our, for the, Customers that we have now, we always link it to something that's essential to the business. It, as we grow in the future, um, 
you know, we'll have a lot of customers. But for now, we focus on customers where something that CleverSafe can uniquely provide is essential to their business. That, that, and that's, that's a pretty intimate relationship with the customer. So it, it depends upon the customer. So, you know, in the, you know, in, in the government environments, you know, security is incredibly important. But resiliency, you know, if you look at the internet itself, the internet itself was designed initially with government requirements in mind to be extraordinarily resistant in a, in a, in a wartime environment. You know, that, um, there are still parts of the government that consider that those kind of requirements. So for them, that, you know, ability to tolerate six simultaneous losses or a higher number, because you can configure it that way, 10 simultaneous losses and still operate, the confidentiality, the integrity, that really drives them. In, in other markets, it, it can be, and it's, it's, it can translate into something about their business. So for other customers of ours, what it really means is, is it, your bottom line is going to have you know three more cents of earnings every quarter, and that's a huge, huge deal for them. So it, it really depends, you know, so, you know. But it, you know, technology capabilities are the same, but it translates into different things for different customers. We're with Chris Gladwin, the CEO and president of CleverSafe. You're a, a, a tech geek, went to MIT, you had a lot yeah. of experience as an entrepreneur. You're running a big business now, growing, uh, big financing you just had. Um, I see you've been to MIT, East Coast, we're here in California. There's a lot of folks out there developing stuff from MIT, some mm -hmm. good tech coming out of sure. these, these big academic yeah. institutions like Stanford and MIT. Um, and cloud is massively growing market. Math is our friend, math is free, right. um, ultimately free with, with the, the compute available. What advice would you give those guys who are starting something? I mean, not, not like, you know, I want to build an iPad app. I mean, there are some deep tech going on. I mean, yeah. here in Cloudera, we have some startups here uh, in uh, Cloudera Labs and Silicon Angle Labs developing some tech. Uh, what advice would you give them? I mean, on your journey, five years, you, you took a different approach uh, mm -hmm. than, than some just getting some venture capital. Yeah. What, what, what advice would you share aspiring entrepreneurs or, or multi-term uh, entrepreneurs? Yeah. Well, the first thing you got to look for is is a very significant benefit to the customer. It, customers are not generally going to buy something from someone new and different that's 20% better. It, 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 you know, that's not going to work. And, and a competitor can respond to 20% better. You, you've got to find just fundamental transform their business or you know, transform their life kind of benefits. So that's the first thing. And so you, you got to have, you, you can't underestimate the competitors. I mean, they're not going to let Roll you over. have their market. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it's got to be fundamentally better to be the new entrant. So that's the first thing you look for. The second thing, the number one reason most new businesses fail is they don't last long enough. They're usually right, but they're wrong about the timing. And, and they're always wrong on the optimistic side. So you can't believe your own PR. Just because you're introducing this thing, and it's great, it doesn't mean that everyone's ready to buy it, and it doesn't mean they're going to buy it tomorrow. So you also have to look at timing. And, <coughs> and I like to find businesses where the mega trends are on your side. Like in our case with CleverSafe, you know, if you just look at hard drive storage, which is the bulk of big storage, and eventually this will be true of Flash as well, hard drives on a Moore's Law adjusted basis get slower every year. Eventually it will take a month months to read or write a whole hard drive worth of data, which makes those systems less and re less reliable because if they fail, it'll take a month to rebuild that. That's good for us because we solved that problem. We go to make that go away. So if the pain isn't great enough for you as a customer with a 12-hour rebuild time, well, we'll be back because it's soon going to be 24 hours and it's soon going to be a week. And so that's just a matter of time. And there's other things that we look for like that where we just know where, you know, this is going to happen. And you know sometimes the customer is ready to go now, and sometimes they'll they'll be back in three years. But it's going to happen. So how that's what you look how for. You, how, do they, how does an entrepreneur handle the timing? Because you're right. I mean, I would agree with you. Entrepreneurs are very visionary, and they yeah. they tend to be early. And a lot of the web bubble ideas were dead on. Yeah. They're yeah. just ahead of their time. How, how does an entrepreneur handle that timing issue? Because you said you mentioned in your uh, you have some scar tissue where you experienced that in one of your first startups. Um, this one, sure. you take a little different approach. What should an entrepreneur do? How do you keep developing? Kind of keep the idea alive? Um, put it on the shelf? Yeah. Go test market it? And well, you, you got to get at least close. You know, with the wireless tablet thing, I was off by, you know, 15 years. You're not going to last that long. So yeah. you got to, you can be a couple years off, but you got to be within a couple years. Um, and then you got to just, you got to manage it like a business. At the end of the day, what businesses do is they deliver value to customers and get paid for it and get paid <laughs> enough that they can make money yeah. that's what businesses do and 
that's never going to change. So it's okay to have a you know front end business model to keep you alive and keep you in the market getting data requirements. Yeah. You okay with that? Yeah. A lot of times, what you're doing in the early stages of a startup is you're learning. You know, you're learning how to describe the great thing that you've created. You're learning who should be the person, you know, the type of customer that you should approach. There's a lot of learning that goes on. And, and, and you've also got to be careful to not, um, you know, there's times when you, you might think, oh, I got to like really start spending more money on, every, on this, 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 and this. And, you know, if this whole thing's got to happen in the next three months, we got, you know, you got to be careful not to do that too early. When that time comes, you got to hit it. But you also, if you hit that wrong and you hit that early, you, you, you know, it's extremely difficult to recover from. It's a little. It's it's easy to recover from a little bit of hesitancy on that. But you, if you, as long as you don't wait too long. But if you think the market's going to go too, you know, soon, and yeah. you start spending, you'll spend yourself out, and you'll never come Question back. Question for you: Obviously, you're, you've done some really really good tech, and you've written a uh, number of patents, hundreds of patents. Um, the question I always get from entrepreneurs is, when do I file a patent? If do I file a patent? Obviously, some of these internet stuff, time timing's critical, and maybe maybe, maybe patents will work or not. Uh, what's your view on patents? I mean, you have a lot of them. I mean, it's obviously on the on one end, you know, if it's deep tech, protect it, get yep. patentable. When yeah, should an entrepreneur know, like, okay, I got to start filing patents or provisional patents or whatever? It depends. I mean, it's always good to file. Uh, I mean, your patent is not arbitrary. I mean, if the patent has very defined standards for what's patentable. It has to really be a genuine invention. It has to be usable. It has to be not obvious, right? Those are the three criteria. So you have to have patentable stuff. It's just you don't just get a patent because yeah, you want like it. a degree. <laughs> yeah. so, so obviously that's the first qualification. It's got to be patentable, um, which is not necessarily an easy standard, you know, because a lot of things, you know, there's a lot of prior art, you know. So that's, I mean, that's legally a minimum requirement. In terms of the, if you now have, if you have stuff that is patentable, do you file? You generally want to. Um, it has a lot of benefits. Uh, it will give you credibility in the market, <coughs> and it'll help validate you to your customers, to press, to potential acquirers, to potential partners, to investors. So it, it, it's, it's useful in that sense. You shouldn't expect, as a, as a kind of a new company, that you're going to collect royalties, because the time in which that could happen is oh, yeah, way down. You're not going to get the patent for four years, yeah. and you know the idea that you're going to sue somebody and get money, that's, just, that's very rare. Um, you sue some companies, and they're going to sue you back with a thousand of their patents, yeah. and you're the dead end. I mean. Yeah, so so it's not so much about I'm going to monetize this, and I'm just going to sit there and collect royalties, but it does have value in all those other things. The and credibility, it's, it's very long tracking investors, showing some defensibility. Yeah, some of those key requirements yeah. of investment yeah. in a business. More than likely, as you said, you're not going to use it offensively. More than likely, you're not going to use it, other than to kind of give you some credibility. I mean, you're not going to use it in the short term. But if you do, the most likely way will be defensive, is that you'll get sued by somebody else and you'll need it. We're here with Chris Gladwin, the president and CEO of CleverSafe, talking about uh, his business at CleverSafe, the innovative approach with dispersal, um, talking about uh, lessons for entrepreneurs, CIOs. Final question um, for you, Chris, is should we arrow forward five years or so? Mm -hmm. uh, we talked earlier about how we've seen in the 80s the shift and then how things changed. What's going to happen over the next five years in your mind? And that's not so much from a clever safe standpoint, just from a market. Yeah. You know, what's going to change? What's going to be different in five years? Uh, you know, what will continue? What, what might shift? Just speculate a little bit. Yeah, I mean, it's hard. You know, I'm, I'm, I get very specialized. So for the past five years, I've thought a lot about cloud storage. So I can, you know, talk a lot about that. When you get me outside of that, I get really stale really fast. But in the world of cloud storage, it's going to take at least five years for the industry to broadly transition. It's, I mean, look, you know, everyone thinks like mobile telephony happened overnight because their experience of adopting mobile telephony happened overnight. One day they got a phone. Yeah. But that's not how it works. The, the time from the first working mobile phone call, wireless phone call, to the first commercial wireless phone call was about 15 years took a little while for that to become obvious. It's very obvious now, but it wasn't so obvious in the 70s. Um, th the same thing is true. I mean, it, you know, you get in Silicon Valley and, you know, come to the Clever Safe office, and it might seem very obvious what's going to happen in cloud storage, but that doesn't mean every single storage yeah. administrator is <laughs> on the page for next quarter's purchases. So five years is not that much time, and, you know, I think five years is really a realistic time 
of how long it will take for the industry to broadly adopt and deploy cloud storage. Congratulations. Thanks for coming on, Chris. Really appreciate it. You're uh, very smart and clever and got the, um, the credentials and great tech with Clever Safe. Uh, security, obviously, a big focus. Thanks for coming on the Cube. I'm John Furrier with SiliconAngle.com and SiliconAngle.tv. We're inside the Cube in Palo Alto at the home of big data, Cloudera, where we sublease some space and we have our SiliconAngle Labs. Thanks for coming on. Thanks, we look John. forward to next time.